Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. As we greet you from Rawal Pindi in Pakistan in blessed Ramadan with assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and with Ramadan Kareem. We were for 17 months. Our topic is a our topic is a milk al yameen and I understand it's going to be difficult. Uh, but may Allah help us, inshallah, to address this subject. I, I gave a talk on milk al yameen uh, maybe 10 years ago. Uh, just about 14 minutes long, and I've never again addressed the subject. After 10 years now, I return to the subject of milk al yameen Our Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, received a gift of a slave woman from the Macarcus of Egypt. And she was a Coptic Christian. And her name was Maria. And with her, he had a son whose name was Ibrahim. And uh, Ibrahim died when the night of the eclipse. And people were saying it's because <laughs> the eclipse is because of the death of the sun. And he explained, no, 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 the eclipse is another phenomenon. I think he was about three years of age. What was her status? Did he make a nikah with her? How did she become his wife? There is absolutely no certain, no confusion whatsoever at all, no doubt at all, that her status is that of a wife. And she is included amongst the Ummahat al Mu'minun. So after the death of the Prophet, no one could marry her. That's the implication that she is the mother of the believers, meaning that you cannot marry her. It could not have been a nikah or a contract of marriage because a contract of marriage is only possible with a free woman. Because you cannot marry a woman without her consent. She has to consent in order for the marriage to take place. A father cannot force a marriage on his daughter. It would be an invalid contract if he did that. So did he release her? Did he free her? Did Nabi Muhammad free her and she became a free woman? And then he proposed marriage to her and she had the freedom to either accept or reject. No, this never happened. And there's not even a shred of evidence to support this. As a consequence, there was no contract of nikah. And yet she was a wife. So how then, in what way, what is the legal status of this union when she's not a wife of nikah? In what capacity, legal capacity, is she a wife? That is the question. In a previous, in a previous video, we asked a question. We said, that was the old law of fasting. And for 17 months in Medina, we fasted with the law of the previous Sharia, which was to fast from sunset to sunset on dispersed days of the year. <coughs> no food, no drink, and no sexual, <coughs> no sex, excuse me. No sexual relation. It's difficult to give these lectures in Ramadan when you're fasting. So it was after 
17 months in Medina, when it had become plain and clear that the rabbis rejected the Quran and rejected Nabi Muhammad as a Nabi and are now conspiring to destroy Islam. Then did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intervene and change the Qibla. And this is Naskh. Surah Al-Baqarah. That we do not cause any ayah to be abrogated, to be cancelled, but that we, or to be forgotten, but that we replace it with that which is better or similar. Here is an example of Naskh. The previous Sharia is now Mansukh for us, not for them. And is replaced with a new Sharia, that this is now our Qibla. And your Qibla is yours and ours is ours. And Allah says, you must not follow their Qibla and they must not follow your Qibla. You are two separate Ummahs. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed the law of fasting. And we were very happy because for, for us this was better. <laughs> he says, lakum. It is now halal for you. Laylat siyam during the nights of the fast of Ramadan. Rafathu ila nisaikum to approach your woman for intimate relations. So we're very happy because in the old law, you have to spend the whole night, you cannot touch them. In the new law, you are allowed to go to them for intimate relations during the night time until the light of the day is distinct from the darkness of the night. Then the fast will begin. And let me pause for a moment to say, to remind you, that when Allah speaks of the light of the day being distinct from the darkness of the night, He wants you to look up in the sky. You can't abandon looking up in the sky and look instead at a piece of paper, which tells you when to start the first. You can't abandon looking up in the sky to listen to some siren or the azan. No, you ha I look up at the sky every morning, every morning. And in looking up at the sky, there is baraka for you, and there's also knowledge for you. So he said, eat and drink, and you can now turn, approach them for intimate relations. But why did he use the word nisa? Nisa is woman. Why did he not say wives? That you are now permitted, you are now, is now permitted for you to go to your wives for intimate relations. That was the question I asked. And now let me answer the question. Some of you sent me emails and your answer was correct. <laughs> yes, and I congratulate you. The first reason why he used the word nikah, sorry, Nisa is because Nisa is a woman. And everywhere in the Quran that Allah speaks about intimate relations, He always uses the word woman and He never uses the word child. Never. And in fact, in one part of the Quran, He says, Nisa'ukum harzulakum. Your woman uses the analogy of a farmer. I couldn't explain this in the presence of women, so I'm happy we don't have any women in the room today. Your woman uses the analogy of a farmer, and the farmer plows the field, and the farmer plants the seeds. Yeah? So he says, your woman 
are like your fields. You can plow your fields in whichever way you want to plow them. Because Umar radiallahu ta'ala had, had engaged in intimate relations with his wife, but from the back. And the, the Jews had said if she, if, if she becomes pregnant and the child is born, the child will be quintide. And it is, in, it is in response to that Umar coming to the Prophet on this subject that Allah sent down the verse. No, no, no. You are free to plow your fields in any way that you want. Provided that you are plowing a field. A field is one in which if you plant a seed, there is a possibility that it can fertilize and become a plant. And that is only possible when a woman has reached Baliga, when she is having the menstrual period because an egg is born. And if the neg egg is not fertilized during that lunar month, then the, the menstrual blood flushes it away. And a new egg is born. This is Allah's hikmah. So if she has not reached the age of Baliga, she does not qualify as a field. And to have intimate relations with her is sinful. But they will say, no, no, no. She was six years of age. Now, I am not concerned about what age the, the marriage was consummated with Aisha radiallahu ta'ala. That is not our subject. So don't bring it up. I am concerned about the age of nikah. And uh, the hadith says that he married her at the age of six. Let me repeat that. He married her at the age of six. And I say, at the age of six, no child is a woman. And if you would have sexual relations with a child, you should be sent to jail. You should be imprisoned. You're, you're violating the rights of a child. But if you have a nikah with a child at the age of six, and you say, no, you're not allowed to have sexual relations with her, until she reaches the age of Baliga. Then how many police officers are we going to have to appoint to go in that house to ensure? Because once he marries her, he has the right to bring her in his home. Once he marries her, he has the right to be private with her. So every pedophile in the world now will be happy to become a Muslim. Did you hear me? The Australian government doesn't know what to do with all the pedophiles they have. So every pedophile in the world will want to become a Muslim. Because they can marry her now at the age of six. So are you going to appoint police officers to remain in the house morning, day and night? And go in the bedroom as well to ensure he does not have any sexual relations with that child after he marries her? Don't you have any sense in your head? Your women are like your fields. You can only go to that field when it is a field. And it is only a field where you can plant a seed and it can fertilize after she has reached Bahaliga.
She has reached the age of puberty. So this hadith is in conflict with the Quran. And so, why has he said, go to your woman for intimate relations? And my answer is the first explanation for the use of woman. It is now halal for you. During the nights of fasting. Rafathu ila nisaikum to 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 have to approach your woman for intimate relations. The first answer I have to offer is Allah is reminding you in this verse, as well as in numerous other verses in the Quran, that you can have intimate relations only with a woman. And not with a child. Having said that, now there's a second uh, explanation. And that is that intimate relations are permissible in Islam, not only with women who are your wives of nikah, but also with a second category of women who are known as milkal yameen. And there are probably 14, 15 verses of the Quran on the subject of Milk al Yamin. So, this is the answer why he used the word woman and he did not use the word wives. And our Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, he had a Milk al Yamin. She was Maria. If he if he had, if he, the Prophet Islam, had a milk al yamin who was Maria, and it was not exclusive for him, then that becomes a sunnah. If the Prophet Islam married Aisha, radiallahu ta'ala on her, at the age of six, as Bukhari says, as Muslim says, as so many books of hadith say. Then did Allah give him permission only for him and for no one else to marry a six-year-old child? Is there even a shred of evidence that this was only for you, O Muhammad Ali Wasallam, for nobody else? It's too late to manufacture evidence now. There's no evidence of that. None. Well then, if our Prophet married Aisha radiallahu ta'ala at the age of six, then it is sunnah. Are you listening to me? I'm pointing at you. Show some integrity now. Stand up like a man. If he married a child at the age of six, and this was not a permission granted to him exclusively and to no one else, there's no evidence of that, then it becomes a sunnah to marry a six-year-old child. Can you refute me? Stand up if you can. It is a sunnah to marry a six-year-old child. This is irrefutable logic. This is irrefutable rationality. How many? Do you know of anyone in this ummah? In 1400 years who has followed the sunnah? I don't have evidence of even one person, not one. In history! who has followed this sunnah, this bogus sunnah. Not one. But yet you insist obstinately, arrogantly now, because I'm teaching you and you would not listen. So it's arrogance on your part. No, 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 this hadith is correct. This is, sun, this is, this is a sahih hadith. It has to be correct. 
And I'm saying to you, well, then why don't you marry a six-year-old? No, they will never do it. Why don't you give your daughter in marriage at the age of six? No, you won't do it. Nobody will do it. Unless you go, you're fit for a mental asylum. And so you're now exposed. You are now exposed as a people who cannot think. Because you insist that this hadith is correct, but you betray, you betray the hadith. You will not follow that sunnah. So it was a sunnah. That was a sunnah. When he took Maria as a miracle, I mean. But this was a bogus sunnah. Because he never married her at the age of six. This is in conflict with the Quran. I am not concerned with the age of consummation of the marriage. I am concerned with the age of the nikah. So don't run away from me. Stand up like a man and defend it. I'm challenging you. I don't like to use the word challenge. But on this issue, I am challenging you. Come on and answer me. Tell me whether you're willing to marry a six-year-old child. I have to tell you this story. <laughs> I went to a masjid in northern Scotland. And the imam who was born in Britain and a graduate of Adarulu, he was instantly attracted to my scholarship and he accepted my view that the Hadith is in conflict with the Quran or marrying a six-year-old child. And after I left and he went to his dark room and they convinced him that it was correct. <laughs> so when I went back to Northern Scotland and I met him, I was surprised with his change of views. So then I asked him, would you be ready to marry a six-year-old child? And he said, yes. The first human being in history I've ever heard, <laughs> I've ever found, willing to say, willing, I'm willing to marry a six-year-old child because of the absolute totality of brainwashing, incapable of thinking. And so now we return. If Nabi Muhammad had a milk al yameen, then it is sunnah to have a milk al yameen. Because Maria was not a wife of Nikah, she was a wife of milk al yameen. Who is a wife of milk al yameen? Well, she was a slave, there was no doubt about that. She was a slave. And uh, the answer that is always given by all our scholars is that a milk al yameen is a woman who is a slave. And if you get possession of her, and she's a slave, she, uh, you get justly get permission of her, then she becomes your milk al yameen, and you can have sexual relations with her. And since slavery is no longer uh, uh, permitted in the world today, all these verses of the Quran pertaining to milk al -yameen. Now listen carefully. They have all become obsolete and redundant. And therefore should be put in a place called cold storage. This is the state of Islamic scholarship today. That <laughs> so many verses of the Quran have now become obsolete and redundant because they can no longer be applied today. I, refer, I refuse to accept that view. I believe that no verse of the Quran can ever become redundant and obsolete. And this is truth and truth is eternally valid. And therefore, it is necessary for our scholars to engage in scholarly research, including ijtihad, independent thinking, in order to find the means and ways whereby milk al yameen, the ayat of the Quran on milk al yameen, can be applicable today. 
I believe that Allah has blessed me and I'm not boasting because if you boast, Allah will take away your knowledge. I believe that Allah has blessed me with the knowledge and the capacity and the methodology for the study of the Quran. That if I devote adequate time and attention to the subject, and it is not going to be easy, not at all, that it is possible for me after prolonged studies to be able to come up with an understanding of all the verses of the Quran pertaining to the subject of milk and amin. And then to go to the hadith on the subject and to expand the database with all the hadith which are in harmony with the Quran. And then to come to a conclusion of how milk and amin is applicable today. But I will not go down that road because I don't have the time for it. But someone must do the work because our Prophet said Islam, the time will come when one man will have to maintain 50 women. One man will have to maintain 50 women. How many times must I repeat that? And a woman needs more than a place to live and food to eat and clothes to wear. If a woman does not have the arms of a man, she can grow ill. She can become mentally unstable because she has biological needs. And it will be cruel, cruel, cruel not to offer her a halal means, a halal means of resolving her, her needs, her biological needs. Because if we do not offer a halal mean, shaitan will offer a haram means. Which reminds me, <laughs> now don't be annoyed with me. Don't be annoyed with me. There's a, there's a difference between a man and a rat. Men would take her out into the sunshine in the open. This is my wife. And she will live with honor and respect in society. But a rat will keep her in the dark. With no respect and no dignity. And whatever is in the dark today, believe you me, tomorrow will come out in the light. So don't be, don't be rats, be men. And so now, I have advised. A milk al yamin is an institution that Allah has given in the Quran. When you do not have the means to be able to take another wife. Remember, if you take a second wife, you have to treat you, all your wives with equity. You have to share with equity with your wives. But you don't have the means to do so. If you take a second wife and you have to have equity, you have to bring down the standard of living of the first one. That's not right. So what do you do when there are women who need husbands and you don't have the means to marry them, but they need husbands? Because one man will have to maintain 50 women. It is here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his wisdom has given the institution of milk al -yameen. Because if she is your milk al -yameen, you do not have to maintain her equal with your wife. Rather, you will maintain her only to the state, to the extent that you have capacity to maintain her. So she'll have food, she'll have clothing, she'll have shelter, and she'll have the arms of her husband in which to find comfort and uh, satisfaction. But she will not be maintained equally with a wife. If you have children with her, however, the children of the milk al yamin have an equal status with the children of the wife, no difference between them, insofar as inheritance is concerned. 
And if you die, she does not inherit from you, but your wife would inherit from you. But this is the preserve of the scholars of law, and I'm not a scholar of law. So I, I am inviting the scholars of law, the young ones who are not afraid, the young ones who are not afraid to become scholars of law and take up this subject. Take up this subject because I can't do it. I have too much other work to do. And uh, make a critical study of all the verses of the Quran on milk al yamin and try to find, organize them as a harmonious whole. And then when you locate what my teacher calls a system of meaning on the subject, you'll understand the divine wisdom at work. And then you'll come to the conclusion, I am telling you in advance, that Milk al yamin is not exclusively a slave. No. And Milk al yamin is an, a, a crucially important institution for resolving the problems of Akhir Zaman. What do we do in the meantime? I'm getting so many emails, not only from men, from women as well. Sheikh, I, I, I want to become the Milk al yamin I'm off, I, can, I want to offer myself. Or oh, a man, Sheikh, she's willing to become my milk I mean, tell us how to proceed. And I am getting all the emails. And this is all I can say to you at this time. I'm sorry, I cannot say more than this because I have not done the study which has to be done. That yes, you can take her as your milk I mean, if she offers herself. And you have a duty now to maintain her, to protect her, to guard her. But if you want to have sexual relations with her, then I advise you, if you do not want to be accused of zina, that you should make a contract of nikah with her. The contract of nikah is only for those who are going to shout at you and say that you are committing zina, only for them. But between you and her and Allah, this is your milk al yameen. I hope and I pray that our brothers, the men of this ummah, would, would take, would look to see how many women we have. The increasing number of women now who do not have husbands, who do not have a man in their life, and who would either marry, take more than one wife to the extent that you have the means to do so. And if you do not have the means to do so, then take her as a milk al yamin in order to maintain her. But if you want to have sexual relations with her, then in order to protect yourself from being accused of zina, then make a nikah with her. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.